Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Forest Presbyterian Church Online. Uh, We're glad to see you here again with us this morning, wherever you may be in the world. And we're glad that you have joined us to worship God and to give thanks for everything that God's done through us in this season. We're so thankful for you and thankful for your ministry, whatever it may be right now. And are looking forward to connecting you uh, with Jesus and with uh, new ministries in his name. First, uh, this week we will continue to broadcast on, online, as you can see here, but we will also have a drive-in service at 1030. We ask people to park uh, one spot apart and bring your mask so that in case you do encounter somebody uh, during, the, during the time that you're here, uh, just we ask that you have the mask ready and, and available to use. Uh, we will also, at uh, that service, collect uh, canned goods for Bedford Christian Ministries, but you can bring that any time during the week. Uh, We'll be glad to take that. We think that the need in this area is going to be kind of a lagging indicator. In other words, the economy has been bad here for a while, and that's usually uh, when a little later things, needs will come up for people personally. So please do continue to bring uh, canned goods, non-perishable food items to go to Bedford Christian Ministries so that they can service people in the Bedford area, and that includes Forest here. Uh, we are, we, as we hear from different things about school, we're also collecting backpacks uh, for the kids. Uh, I feel confident that even if the kids don't go back to school physically, uh, that the school system and Bedford Christian Ministries will figure out a way to get those backpacks to the kids in our school system uh, because they'll still need school supplies no matter where they're doing school, whether they're doing it in person or doing it at home. So uh, we want to continue that ministry as well. That started, we, we usually uh, pack backpacks uh, for, for kids for the school system. So that's already started in earnest. Uh, you can bring that Sunday as well. Uh, we know that phase three is going to begin on July the 1st. For the church, that means we're going to still gradually move uh, into our next phase. So we will still have worship outdoors on the uh, the first Sunday there, which is July the 5th. Uh, but we will do that in an, in an atmosphere on the lawn. So you can leave your cars at that point. Again, you'll still be able to stay in your cars if you want to. We will still have the FM radio broadcast. But you can get out of your cars. We'll spray, area, spray uh, markings on the ground so that you'll know the area that you can go to. But you'll be able to go outside uh, onto the lawn there. We'll turn the service in a different direction uh, toward the grass uh, so that people can set up lawn chairs and those kind of things. But still be socially distant, still be outside, but it's kind of a gradual move uh, towards worshiping in person again. Um, and so we want to do that still carefully, but also in a celebratory way. And it'll be the 4th of July anyway. It'll be a great time to be outside uh, and to, to worship God and, uh, and, and to celebrate our nation too. Uh, thank you for your continued generosity. Uh, you can continue to donate to the church at uh, forestchurch.org slash donate. If you come Sunday morning, we will have uh, a box to, to uh, put your uh, offering in on the way out. Um, you can also uh, mail your offerings to P.O. Box 311, Forest, Virginia, 24551. But we've been just amazed at the way that people have continued to support this church and continue to be connected it is important that you stay connected as a congregation, as a body of Christ. Um, the body of Christ is connected through the Holy Spirit, um, but the Spirit may be calling you right now uh, to, to uh, call somebody that you normally see in church, in person, just to check on them and to see how they are doing. Um, this Just because we're not meeting in person does not mean the body of Christ does not still exist, because it does. Uh, so. So do uh, continue to minister to one another, to care for one another, and to love one another in Christ's name. Again, blessings that you're here. Uh, We are so glad to be together. Let's begin our worship today with prayer. Lord God, we're so thankful to be together and thankful that you have brought so many through this time of of challenge and, and trial. You are a creative but also a redemptive God. Redeem us from our current circumstances walk through this situation with us and as we gather to praise your name may we recognize realize and exalt your holy name through jesus christ our lord amen now let us join together in song as we sing praise to the lord Bless 
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. It's a blessing to be in this place this morning that God has brought us together to give thanks, but also to lift up prayers on behalf of our community, our nation, and our world. Let us join together in the prayers of the people. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, you have cared for us so much as you walked beside your people Israel in the wilderness. You walked beside us and guide us throughout this challenging time. We are thankful for the healing that you have done and ask for more. Not just for coronavirus, but for those suffering from cancer or heart disease or dementia or any illness that they might find. We pray for your power and spirit upon them you would watch over them and care for them. We pray for those who have suffered loss. By now, many of us have heard the names of some who are close to us who have died in recent days. We pray for families. We pray for all those who are grieving. We pray that all might have enough to eat today that no one would be hungry, that all would have a place to live, and that all would find not just a job, but work that's fulfilling. We pray for struggling families, and we pray for children in these challenging times. Lord, we ask that you would be with the nations of this world that you would grant leaders wisdom and that you would grant us all peace. We pray for our president and our Congress, for the governor here in the Commonwealth and our General Assembly. And for all who lead us here locally. And finally, Lord, we pray for your church. 
that this minor hardship of the last few months will give way to glory and honor in your name. We thank you for the work of the 224th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, which met this weekend. And we pray that all Presbyterians in every time and place would be connected to one another through your Holy Spirit. For the church is not just here on our corner and forest, but the church is where all those gather in your name to give thanks and glorify you. May the mission of your church be strong and diverse and meet the needs of your people, the people that you are calling and the people who are in need in every place in this world. Until your kingdom comes, we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture text this morning is from Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. Let us pray as we approach God's word. Lord God, through your Holy Spirit, speak to us today through the words of scripture. As Paul wrote to the church so many years ago, they heard not his voice, but through the Holy Spirit, yours. May we hear your voice today as well. Not just words on a page or words from a mouth, but words from your heart. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are either slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you, had, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. I once was complaining to a friend of mine about having to do something in the world, in life, or in professional circles. And my friend looked at me because I was saying, I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I have to do this. And my friend looked at me and said, have to or get to? My friend's comment just took me aback because it made me realize that my mindset towards the world and towards life had become this mindset of doing what others wanted me to do 
rather than doing what I felt called and led to do. And many of the things that I was talking about were things that I felt like I was called and led to do. But it was my mindset about it that was warping it, changing it. When Paul addresses the people in Romans, and particularly here in Romans 6, he's trying to get them to change their mindset about what they do from day to day as a church. He's trying to move them from have to to get to. It's why he talks about sin and contrasts sin with grace. It's a confusing kind of conversation because he talks about the things that they have talked about having to do and the things that they get to do. The way that they've talked about how their bodies are controlling them, how they're not in control of their life, And now, when God has forgiven them and given them grace, what are they to do next? Many of the things that they're going to do were things they were complaining about doing before. But now God's wanting them to do the same things, but to have an attitude adjustment about it. Early on in the text of Romans, Paul quotes Habakkuk, which says, The righteous one will live by faith. You may have heard it said, A righteous man will live by faith. A righteous human being will live by faith, according to the Hebrew and the Greek here. A righteous person will live by faith means that if we trust in the Lord, we will want to do the right things for the right reason. The goal of life, according to Paul, is faith and obedience. Trust and obey, as the old song says. So if we will change our attitude towards many of the commandments, they will become get-tos instead of have-tos. Paul uses a very strong metaphor here today. He talks about slavery, which is something that we know causes trauma and pain for generations. We're talking about the aftermath and the effects of that much more today in our culture uh, in in the United States here in the 21st century. But imagine in Paul's day when slavery existed and people were, pe- were trying to be set free from that institution. They had an example around them. They knew trauma from day to day. And they knew what it might be one day to be free. So with us as a nation being free talking soon about the 4th of July when people celebrate freedom. And now when everyone in our nation can talk about freedom, at the time Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, not everyone in Virginia and in the nation could say they were free. But now we have the opportunity in our nation to be more and more free. That's the metaphor that Paul is using to live life in a way that is more and more free to follow God. And Paul is using the example of wages to talk about that. I remember my first job and I remember how boring most of it was. Sweeping floors, cleaning. Every now and then somebody would let me help out I remember my boss saying one time when I was looking for something to do, he would say, just go sit over there and wait. Oh, I hated it. I was trading my time for money. At the moment, if you could have given me, I think it was probably $3 back then, if you could have given me, three, told, asked me if I wanted three fifty or to go and do something on my own, I would have said, hey, keep the three fifty. I'll go run around. But as it is, you've spent those that week maybe two weeks depending on your job. You've traded your time already and then comes payday and you get your money. You get your wages. Paul is also contrasting the way that we work in the world with have to and get to. Work is a have to. You trade your time and someone gives you money. And for Paul's analogy, he says when you work for sin, you get wages of death. 
You get paid for that. You're owed that. You're owed a spiritual death. You've got it already. You don't need to wait until the afterlife. The wages of sin are death right now. You open that envelope. You click on your bank account online. And what it says is death. Due to all the things that you've been having to do in life. Allowing yourself to do in life. But Paul contrasts that with the free gift of grace. As he says, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. There are no wages, nothing is traded for it. God gives it to you. You must simply accept it. And other things come along the way. He talks about sanctification. Nailing Paul down here in Romans is pretty tough. Following his argument from chapter 1 all the way to the end is really the only way to fully understand it. Reading it in small sections can be difficult at times. But we've always heard the wages of sin is death, and so let's talk about another passage in Romans and let's move on from that. Well, you just need to know that if you die, you're going to hell. That's what someone might say. But the spiritual death is deeper than that for Paul. Paul's not talking about after now. Paul's talking about now. And the eternal life is not about after now. Notice he doesn't say the afterlife, eternal life. Eternal life begins right now in the free gift of God. That means in the things you are doing now. Not living a life that's geared towards heaven, towards something that's coming later but living a life that's geared towards the kingdom, living a life towards the thing that is at hand. When we die, we are in paradise that moment. Our souls are in paradise when we believe in Christ. But Paul is talking about living before you ever die, before you leave this earth. The free gift of grace is that you can switch your mentality, your spirit, your heart, your mind, your soul from a have to to a get to. So what in your life today are you switching from have to to get to? Has family been a have to? And the joy and the grace and the gift that God gives you in family can become a get to? Has work become a have to? We've talked about wages here. Are you doing the work that you do because it's a job, as one of my uh, professors told me one time? Or do you have work? Do you have that thing you have to do or the thing that you want to do? What did God make you to do? God made you to make, God made you to do the thing that fulfills you and fulfills this world. So turn your work life from a have to to a get to. What about the other moments of life? The times with friends, neighbors, your community. Many things in this life we think someone else is going to take care of. Those are things that they have to do and we don't have to do. But what if we all turn that from a, get, a have to to a get to. Life would change if people were doing what they did in order to fulfill the grace of God. Life in the community of the church, in, the, in our surrounding community, and in the world would be so much better. This is what Jesus Christ has called us to do. You're to be under grace every day to be under the grace of God, to feel not the obligation of sin, but the joy, the hope, and the promise of grace. So as we live into each moment from day to day, may God show us the gift of grace and may we live into it, moving from have to to get to. Let us pray. Lord God, show us the way and show us the path in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
that we may find grace and peace and hope and love and joy and all the things that are added to it and make us closer to you. As Paul promised here in sanctification, that your spirit would draw near us and draw us closer to you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, not because we have to, but because we want to. Amen. Now go forth, have a great week. May God bless you. May God's face shine upon you. And may you have peace.